everyone, welcome to Beyond. Be sure to hit like and subscribe so others can find the channel. And today, the man needs no introduction. Welcome, Burke Brown. What's up, Ben? Good to see you, my man. Hey, did you have a great fourth? Great fourth, man. Was a with family. I uh, saw some fireworks off in the distance. For some reason, the county was allowing it, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, I saw this uh, video over LA where I saw that too. Yeah, right. Newsom <laughs> said no fireworks. Everywhere, and the whole valley was lit up. So let, let's let's give us your, let's give us our, our opinion on that mandate. So right. uh, yeah, hey. So you know, we've had a, a great series with roadmaps resilience. We've talked about a lot of great uh, uh, topics for sure. Right. We talked about resilience. We talked about building a, a solid life foundation, mastering anger, um, stress management, power of purpose, developing self-confidence, and obviously we talked failure habits, and then last week, those habits that can get us ignored. And when I thought about everything in total, what we've been working on, I think there's one element that, that just sort of struck me. It's like, you know what? We could work our whole lives at trying to better ourselves, but there's this invisible enemy coming in, and it's a whole word or term called gaslighting. And just for the audience, gaslighting is defined as a psychological form of manipulation in which a person or a group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or group, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment, often evoking them in them cognitive dissonance, right? So, you know, it, it's such a profound idea. We can work our tails off to be the better version of ourselves, yet what we sometimes don't realize is the psychological impacts that people are having on our lives on our thoughts and our thinking. Mm -hmm. And Shannon Alder once said, lies don't end relationships, the truth does, right? And, and guy, gaslighting really are lies with a purpose to confuse and control at the end of the day. So I would argue, and you probably know this better than anybody in your research, gaslighters are absolute crazy makers. I'm sure we could look at past relationships we've all been in and you walk away and say, was it me? <laughs> what was that, right? right? You could see something with a gaslighter and you can, dis you, you, you can sort of talk about an event with that person and they'll make you think you didn't see what you saw. And it can really be flummoxing for a lot of people. So um, this is kind of what I want to dive into today, Berkey, and, and sort of uh, see end. if we can sort of call out sort of the, 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 the attack, um, the approach, and, and some remedies to, to make, you know, make ourselves more aware of actually what's going on. Mm -hmm. Let's go. I love it. Yeah. So um, we all know that gaslighters are crazy makers for sure. You could record an event, like I said, and they would spin in an opposite direction. So... First, and by the way, to the audience, there's a lot of different uh, sort of strategies for gaslighting, but these are ones that I thought really popped to the service. But certainly the most obvious one is gaslighters lie to you, right? And by the way, here's something, <laughs> the epiphany, right? We talked about groups or individuals. I would argue media, manipulation, politics, fill in the blank. We have a culture, we have a country that is absolutely gaslighting its citizenry, right? <laughs> With all kinds of messages, messages right? all kinds of agendas. So we know they'll lie to you and they're habitual liars, right? They will tell a bull-faced lie and try to convince you that they're telling the truth despite evidence to the contrary. Um, they show extreme conviction in their lies and make you question truth and reality itself. I, I, I've been in situations where I saw something very clearly and you explain it and they're just like making you think you didn't see what you saw. It, it's yeah. really interesting. So I think ultimately they leave the victim, you know, confused and off balance. So in your experience and your studies, how can a person spot a gaslighter before the relationship develops? Oh man, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's tough. It's tough because what happens is you can't really spot certain things. We have tendencies to want to be likable. Our, our, our species works in communities. It succeeds when it works together. And so the, the idea is to constantly look for ways that we can trust somebody. Right. And so it's, it's a tough thing. It's not that you can immediately see it. And, and what you were calling with the media and everything, at the end of the day, it's all propaganda. And when you meet somebody, let's say you're at a bar, you meet somebody, they're going to be propaganda. They're going to show a better version, an updated version of you, of what you want. Right. So they're going to show their best self. And what happens is, is they figure out things about you, people that are adept, they'll begin to show up that way. And so it's really difficult because when you see someone showing, you know, characteristics that you like, you affirm those characteristics, which unconsciously allows the person to know, oh, they like this, so then they create more of that. Those are for people that are a little more deceptive in their approach. So really, it's one of those things that you have to really be paying attention to. You have to know who you are. You have to know what you care about. You have to trust your own self. And then as time goes by, I love the quote that you provided, is that it's not that the, the lies are what break up a relationship, it's the truth. It's that when you know who you are, 
then you can start to trust your own beliefs, your own thoughts about that person and about that experience. Now, the truth is ultimately, and I hope we get here, gaslighting truly is happening in our own minds. The propaganda starts first in our brain, and then we allow it to go out within uh, you know, the relationships that we have, whether we look on the news or whatever. It's we gaslight ourselves. So until you can build that radar that can find out that BS, that can realize that it's not real, we're gonna find ourselves being tripped up because anything that validates our identity, we're more prone to lean towards, even if it's not reality. So we'll slowly find reasons for it to be real so that it upholds our identity. And a person who doesn't need to uphold their identity by gaining validation doesn't have to succumb to these, these groups, these ideas, these thoughts. So it's, it's really, it's about an internal work that's required in order for you to break free of the deception that's all around us, that we, well, even our own imposter syndrome is a form of gaslighting. You know, it's the gaslighting term is, you know, it's, 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 it's something that we all hear, but we know what it means. It means we're convincing ourselves or being convinced of something that's not entirely real or we're not questioning it. Right. So oftentimes we think of gaslighting of what's coming at us, what a person is mm-hmm. doing to us. Right. And you brought something up interesting that we gaslight ourselves. Can we, can we, let's, let's still into that a little bit further. What does that mean? We gaslight ourselves and what are some things that, that are obvious um, things that we are doing to gaslight ourselves? I've never heard of it quite that way, but it's, right. it's intriguing. It's interesting at the same time, uh, right. the idea that we are our own worst enemy in a sense. So can you sort of walk us through what that looks like? Absolutely, man. So what happens is, for example, I said imposter syndrome. It's the belief that, oh, let's say you get a new job, you get the new job. And while you're there, you're constantly wondering, why did they pick me? Do I belong here? Right? So you all of a sudden immediately assume that everybody else that was picked there belongs and you don't. And so it comes back to this core belief, this belief that we're not capable, this belief that we're not enough. And so when we put ourselves into position, we always assume that we're not worthy of it. Case in point, when I got into Berkeley, man, I was like, did, was this an accident? Did they, did they do this on purpose? Is there, are, are they going to go through the files and realize that they accidentally picked my name and uh, I wasn't supposed to be at the school? Why was that my initial thought getting into the school? Why could I not think that I was absolutely worthy of it? And I was able to because I did incredibly at the school. But not until I got my first grade back did I feel that I was truly a part of the system because I'm like, now you guys can't take me out. And I got my grade back. It was an A. My professor said this was incredible work. At that point, the imposter was able to leave. And then I could really do the work that I had wanted to do. But I had to get myself to a place where I understood that I was was tricking myself. And, you know, when you gaslight, what you do is you repeat a thing so much that it starts to seem that it's real. And in, in psychology, when you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy, there's some, there's some things called thought distortions. And thought distortions are methods in which our mind distorts reality. Our first propaganda is in our brain, right? And usually it works against us. And that's something that's really important to understand. But these are kind of thinking traps that happen. Here's an example. One could be something called all or nothing thinking. And what it means is I literally believe that my option is either to do this perfectly or not do it at all. Like for example, if I, I remember when I was younger, I I told my dad, I said, hey, guess what I got on my test? And he said, 100%. And I'm like, no, 95. That set something in my mind where my mind started to say that if it's not 100%, it's not enough. So what is is success? Success is 100%. What is failure? 99% down. That's all or nothing thinking. It's a distortion of reality. There's something called overgeneralization. What happens is let's say somebody makes a compliment to you, but when that compliment happens, you nullify it. You're like, well, no, the situation, and you start to say why it happened so that you wouldn't feel too big. You make yourself small, right? Another thing is a mental filter. All these great things are happening in your life, and then one thing goes wrong, and that's the thing that you focus on. So there's a whole bunch of different types of distortions. Another one is over magnification. You see the one thing you did right, uh, that you did wrong, and then you magnify that. So it's this possibility of tricking your mind to agree with the fear you have about who you are or what you're not worthy of. So it always starts in our mind because when we get that void of I'm not worthy, then we must seek it outside of us. And that's why we look for worthiness. That's why we drink up the gaslight because it tastes so good in the time, right? That's why we drink up that, that propaganda. Or what happens is when people make you doubt yourself, you already don't think that you're worthy. So you're like, well, I'll just assume I'll succumb to that idea. Maybe that's really what it is. Maybe I can't trust myself. So that's what it is. So ultimately the truth, as with all the work that we've been talking about, is knowing yourself. It's being able to be present, to be conscious, 
to not be irrational by assuming another person is right, not to be irrational by assuming that the worst things about yourself, but to look at the world plainly and then from there make choices and decisions that are not herd mentality, that are not in, in any type of way. Because sometimes, like we talked about before, the herd may go this way and I may think I'm different because I'm thinking the opposite, but am I just a reaction? It's getting to the place where you're centered and you're looking and you can take pieces of truth from all the noise, right? That's where your power is at. So gaslighting, I think, is typically understood as something external. So what would you argue? It's more internal than external, or does it start internal and then get amplified by the external based I on wanna, the lack of work that we've done in our own lives and I, the lack yeah, of understanding we may have of ourselves? It's a great, a great question. Well put. Uh, absolutely, I think it starts internally. Because what happens is when, when we are, if you look at the process of, of brainwashing, like, and this is something I read a long time ago, but what it is, is it's this, this weird experience where you must be suspended, your reality, you must be suspended from reality. When you're suspended from reality, you don't know what is real and then people can tell you what is real. But in order to break free from reality is you have to let go of your own ideas. You have to let go of your own ideologies, your own beliefs and you have to take on someone else's. But ultimately what happens is that if you are on weak ground, if you cannot stand for something, then you'll fall for everything. So what happens is in order for even propaganda in general to take hold, you have to be at a destitute space. You have to be at a hopeless space. You have to be at a space where you don't trust your own self because then you can latch on to realities that are not your own, especially if they make you feel good. If you don't have an identity, then you will, you will find an identity in something else. I think that you look at kind of our society when, when we're experiencing this grand polarization, it's, there's nothing in the world that is that polarized except good and evil. But there's good and evil in every human being. There's a whole spectrum. But when there's this idea of everything being an existential threat, and this can be even in a relationship, right? When we think that when I broke up, it was that person that, did everything wrong and that's why I broke up. That's insanity. It takes two to tango. But what you must do is you must build a story of why that person is so evil because by me telling you that that person is evil, what does it make me? I'm the good guy. I'm the good angel. Yeah. And so what happens is we, since we have such a fear of being called out, of being seen as an accomplice to a breakup or as being seen as whatever it is or being kicked out of the tribe, what we do is we make an enemy. We, make a, we look in a different direction. And when we look in that direction, we're not doing the work on ourselves. That's why for me, I'm never, I don't care about sides. Like when I talk about sides, it's like, that's not important to me. I know that within every person, there is the spectrum. And if we're not working on those internal spectrums, then we'll fall for whatever ideologies pop out that make us feel a little better about ourselves. But we we don't, you said something work. that was sort of profound and it made me think, what is reality, right? Mm. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? I could be in a million different cultures around the world and a million different ways they've always done things. Mm. And my reality is fundamentally shaped by that culture. Right. And there may be certain drives in human beings and man for freedom, for example. They don't want tyranny. They don't want to live under tyranny, but they want right. to live under free expression, self-expression. But it's a fundamental question. What is reality? We look at what's going on in the United States with mm. um, the protest and cancer culture and basically erasing what is the United States. Well, what is reality? Mm -hmm. um, and you say within a generation or two, we have people that have strident positions where it's just get rid of the United States. And you say, well, where, where'd that reality come from? And it mm -hmm. ultimately probably originated with the seed or a thought or an idea from somebody with an agenda, with a master plan, a bigger, a bigger plan perhaps. But it really begs the question. And then you say, well, if you cancel the culture and you get rid of statues and monuments and people, a lot of people buy into that, I would argue that when you do that, you're prone to repeat the past pretty quickly. In other words, mm. if I eliminated all your moral values and your construct, and you see what's going on with um, uh, Jeffrey Epstein and uh, the madam, whatever her name is. Maxwell, yeah. Maxwell, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, how do people think that that's normal? How do people think that that's okay behavior? Mm -hmm. How do the super rich think that that's a normal thing to participate in? And then again, you go back to what's reality? What's right and wrong, mm -hmm. right? And, and most people would say, well, I can see good and I can see evil. I can see when like Mother Teresa, when she helped the poor in Calcutta, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I can see, you know, uh, serial murders like Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, that's bad. But then you start to get this sort of graying out of that right. whole construct, right? 
and this is pretty fundamental, I mean, because this kind of goes right back into gaslighting because it can absolutely affect how you think, feel, and act on behalf of a common good or a group. Absolutely. Right? And what Absolutely. you said is, is pretty important. Like, who are you? What do you believe? And if you don't believe in anything, and you can have a media come across or Instagram and based on fame, you're willing to alter a position or based on the money, the monetary gain you'll make, you're willing to alter a position. Um, that would argue that would argue that a society is very tenuous. Very, very yeah. tenuous. You know, reality is is <laughs> there's about seven point five billion of them, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so and I think understanding that is an important thing. Because what happens is it gives you the ability to understand other people's perspectives, right? Uh, when you understand a person's perspective, then you're willing to share your reality with someone else. Empathy. Uh, one of the problems is fear is the source of all of our issues in a lot of ways. If I'm angry, it usually starts with fear, right? Uh, if I'm more tribalist in my, in my, my hind brain, uh, it's because I'm in fight or flight, right? It's, it's a reactionary space. And so to, the, the goal is to get people to a rational mind where they can look at things and not, not just say it is wrong, right? Because what happens is for me, when I look at things, I want to understand what's happening within the mind, right? What is happening within the mind? When you look at a person who is in an abusive relationship, I could literally just say, you're insane. Like, what's wrong with you? I could say that but I don't know how that person was raised and maybe how they didn't receive love from a parent in a very specific way or how they had a traumatic experience that caused them to believe they're not worthy of love. And so this person shows them attention and they're getting that attention, but they're also getting abuse, but they're getting that attention. The fact that the person even loves me makes me want to stay, or maybe they'll change. Maybe I can change them. So I, I when you see someone like that, you're, I can't immediately go to this rage, anger, resentment, towards the person. I have to understand that there's a sickness within. And if you look at our society, I don't care which side you're on, there's a sickness because 100%. there is a certainty that how can a massive group of people agree 100% solely on this and a massive group agree 100% solely on this? There is so much nuance. And this is what we talked about last time. I said that, you know, tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance. Mm -hmm. It's the inability to be aware of, I get what's happening. I get why this person is cutting. Like, why would a person cut themselves if they're, uh, uh, there's something where they don't feel that they have control and so they cut, right? There's, there's, there's a psychological reasoning behind, there's an underpinning. And the problem with our society and the reason we're so susceptible to influence is because we don't know how to look at underpinnings. And you wanna know the best way to start to look at the underpinnings? And the underpinning means what are the psychological motivations that, are, that I don't understand, but that make perfect sense within their e ecosystem of thinking. And the truth is the best way to learn and understand others is to learn and understand your own insanity. Because when we understand that all we are are completely irrational human beings with just enough rationality to make it look like we know what we're talking about, then we can step back and say, it's not about me being angry. It's not about the fear of this. You look at, you look at all of this is a cycle. All of this is a cycle. You can, you, can, you can look at the Boston Tea Party. You can look at the riots. You can look at the, 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 the statues being pulled down. This was happening in Iraq. Like this stuff happens everywhere. And it's all, if you look at the story of the individual, it would make sense. But what happens is people are not looking at these stories. What they're looking at is the actions, the behaviors. And when you're in a place where you're looking at your behaviors only, then that, gives, that makes you so susceptible to being manipulated. Because I can look at a behavior and I can ascertain or pull anything out of a behavior. If a person cuts me off, my initial reaction is they did that on purpose. My nephew did that. When he, when he would get hurt, he's like, you did it on purpose. Why did he feel that he had to say on purpose? He knew that if he said that it was on accident, then he wouldn't get the justice he felt he deserved. Right? He wouldn't get the justice he felt he deserved. So he had to say that it was done on purpose because it justified his rage. So he felt hurt, he needed justification for his rage. I get cut off, I need justification for my rage. But the truth is maybe that person has a woman who is pregnant and he needs to get to the hospital. I'm not gonna think that. Injustice to me, rage to them. So mm -hmm. what happens is behaviors are very easy to judge. And what, what is most important is that internal work, coming back to the individual. People get frustrated with me, because like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm like, if you don't know how to go into yourself, and if you don't know how to think from the mind of the other person, then I can't really give you, all I can do is either do one of two things. One is I can give you a little bit of, you know, a, a little piece of candy by agreeing with you, or I can give you a little bit of, you know, something bitter 
by disagreeing with you. But what I can you know, do is I can say, look in. Th this is important, Burke. And, and, and as I see what's going on in cancel culture, you go to you go to universities across America, and I've seen people try to express an opinion, and they get instantly shot down with group think. Right. Um, and the idea that we can't express perspective and opinions, I think the give and take, that's where you learn and grow. That's mm -hmm. how you expand your mind and your thinking. It's almost like on one side of the ledger, these people are like my binky and my, 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 you know, my life raft or my life vest mm -hmm. is this in, in this idea. And if you mm -hmm. rock this idea, then I don't fundamentally know who I am and mm -hmm. what I stand for. So I'm going to hold vociferously onto this idea, no matter how destructive it may be to culture and not really go deep on the issues. And again, it goes, I think it goes back to how this generation has been conditioned, right? It's the monkey right. brain. Right. Um, it's a limbic rich system. It's not, I, I see people all of a sudden instantly react. In fact, a lady, a white woman, uh, there's some altercation with a, a black family, a black mom and a, her daughter with this white couple. And it turned out that this lady pulled a gun on the, on the black couple, which was totally irrational and unproportional what was going on. And good, the good news is she was arrested. She should be. But the idea that people can't ration and reason mm. and say, I'm sorry if I offended you, I, you know, and maybe this black woman had grievances, but I got to tell you in my life, I've never had an experience with an African-American or any ethnicity where I've ever gotten to that level. Yeah. Cause you know, the first thing I do, I seek to understand, I want to get in their shoes, what's going on. I care about that person. Tell me any person's going to rage against you if you show true empathy and care and concern about what's going on, you're putting your arm around their shoulder, trying to look at the world the way they see the world, not the way you want them to see the world. And I think this is important. Yeah. I also think that when you think about, you know, people want to call Trump a racist or fill in the blank. Okay, well, let's use the Socratic method on anything. Anything that somebody tells me, I just simply ask the question, why? I want to drill down on why it is the way they think, the way they think. Because mm -hmm. you know what, Berkeley, I can learn something. And that, at the end of the day, is what it's all about. Because if I'm trying to understand someone's position, that to me is a first step. However, if this position is so recalcitrant and unmovable, that's where I think you get a breakdown. And, and, and you start to gin up the masses. And I think I want to go back to the gaslighting. There's, there's the internal part of it. And then there's the external part of it that's right. happening every day. And I think media with an agenda, with dogma, um, uh, you, know, you used the word I can't remember. But anyways, the media... Um, you know, they really do have an agenda to move people a certain way. And it almost feels like sometimes they don't care if people get hurt or killed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> At you know, all. It's, yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's tough. It's a couple, like one thing that I, that I think when, when I, when I, when I talk about this stuff, cause I do some work in diversity as well and, and talking about racism. So when you, when you identify a person as a racist, you have to understand there's behaviors of racism, right? And so it's, it's, it's difficult to, to say, okay, here is the defining term of what a person is. And I love that you ask questions. I love that Socratic method. And I really agree with it. One of the things that I, that I also recommend people to do is to actually argue the opposite. And when you yourself work to create an argument for something you don't believe, it'll actually help eradicate non-realities within that or give the empathy that is also available. And that takes a lot for a person to say, okay, I believe that it is this way, this is what it is. But then to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually just, I'm gonna try to produce the argument in the other way. And I'm gonna see what I can muster up. And it may not come up to, oh, this is what I believe, but what'll happen is there'll be some concessions that may be available, like, okay, I can understand that, I can understand that. And what happens is by putting ourselves, and this is one of the biggest things that I do, and, and it's hard to transfer, it's hard to teach. As soon as I feel something, I immediately say, where do I do it in my life? Immediately. I, as soon as I make any accusation on a person, I say, where do I do it in my, my, my life? And it doesn't have to be the exact way in the exact system, circumstance, but the mechanism. Because what happens is when I automatically look for that mechanism showing up in my life, it's given me a, a humility to speak from a place of not over-righteousness, right? I'm not coming from the self-righteous space. I'm saying, this is what I see. This is what I don't like. I see how it shows up here, but I can say the effect of it is different when this person's doing that. So what happens is this ability to be Socratic externally by drawing something out of a person, but Socratic internally by drawing a different perspective out of ourselves, right? So that's something that's, that I think is a, is a very important thing, and it's super helpful uh, for us to be better at coming to understandings, right? We have to get to that place where we're not so uh, immediately certain of a thing.
and then from there move down. Because what do we really know? I mean, what's re again, what's reality? What's our certainty based in, right? Usually it's misinformation and have truths. And, and so I think another key tactic of gaslighters is they, and we've sort of been talking about this, they attack your reputation, right? They identify your values and attack them to get you to compromise at some level. Right. Uh, and with the compromise in place, they can undermine your reputation or they'll enlist a group of others, right? They'll have the group think through social media to create the illusion that your behavior is disturbing and, mm. and certainly everyone agrees to it. Or they'll suggest that others think something is wrong with you, even when others have no opinion of, of who you are or what the situation is. So there's a lot of things they do to attack and undermine um, you know, your reputation, which for most people is their currency. When you think about careers, you can have a lot of experience, but ultimately you say, would you want to work with that person? Would you hire that person? You're going to go talk to somebody that's worked with that person and understand that person's reputation. Mm -hmm. Meaning, how do they work on the job? Are they hard workers? Are they smart? Are they capable? All those things. So what can a person do that is being attacked in this way? I mean, if you're yeah. attacked on a global scale or a micro or macro or micro level, what can you do to sort of um, push back this insult? Right, right. You know, you know, I'll pocket into kind of two ideas. One is to uh, free ourselves, uh, to free ourselves from to a certain extent, the injustice and, or the narrative of the injustice and then build ourselves on the narrative of ourselves. And so this is, this is when we were talking about the media and, and the agenda or the media, and we're talking about the uh, social media as well. What I tell myself is that the media is just trying to get us to react. That's it. Their currency is reaction. Their currency is to get us unstable because instability equals click. It's clickbait, right? When I see something that is just so sensational, I clickbait it or something that riles me up in anger or joy or whatever, but anger is, is what, what draws us. Then all of a sudden it creates a system that further does that. If they notice our click rate goes down, they find out what titles make their click rate go up. What keeps us on the station? what keeps us on the social media platform, right? So when you're in social media, it all automatically has a sensationalism attached to it, which means puts you in an unstable state where your emotions are overwhelming, where your comments are going crazy, where you see something and you're like, how the hell are they actually doing that? Like, don't they see that this is so, all of a sudden it puts us into that state which keeps, keeps us unfounded on solid reality. Right. So when I look at them and I say, I take out the injustice of the story, what I say is these people are trying to make a buck. These people, their currency is my attention. And my attention is best controlled with fear, is best controlled with heightened emotions, is best controlled in some type of way where I feel the more that I look, for some reason, I'll feel I'll be getting something that kind of brings me back to some form of stability. The more I know, the better I'll be in control. It's not going to happen. It's an endless cycle. Right. So we have that addiction. If I just look at it as this is a drug. I'm not going to say bad drug. I'm not going to say drug. You have this secret agenda from the, from this government group that's putting this out. I'm just saying you're a bad drug. Then I allow myself to not be emotionally invested because what you resist persists. If I'm angry at that thing, then I must be in contact with it. If I push it away, I'm touching it. You must, you must focus. If I say, don't focus on a purple elephant, there it is. It's right there. What you must do is you must detach, right? We detach from that. And we say, this drug is not good for me. Then I say, what is good for me? Then I focus on myself. And then I start feeding myself things that give me peace. Remember the radio dial of gratitude? We focus on what we're grateful for. We turn the station to what is good. We turn the station to affirmations about ourselves. We turn our, our, our radio station to, okay, there's injustice. What can I do that is just? How can I add to the plus as opposed to add to the fire? And I set that self, myself up for that. Then when I go into these hostile environments, hostile environments meaning the internet, right? Hostile environments could be the television or at work. What happens is I'm not so obsessed with that person at work that is saying the negative things about me or that is trying to work the system around me. What I am doing is I am here to build myself and by building myself, I'm automatically gonna trust myself. As I trust myself, I'm gonna create larger relationships and networks and what will happen is as time goes by, that will actually overflow this one person that's saying the negative things about me. When I build a whole team of people who see me for who I am, then all of a sudden it'll out that person who's saying the negative things. And people will be like, I don't know. 
I, my experience with this person is not the experience that you told me about. And so what happens is you do the same thing. When people are talking to me about the television and all this different stuff, they're like, dang, he's not picking a specific side. But what he's saying is making me think. And there's two people that are thinking different things and they're all thinking because I'm being close and clear to who I am and I'm helping and striving to get other people's to go inside. Because when you're in that place, it's just gas. There's no light. Right. And so how would you think about this in terms of personal relationships? Because I would mm. argue that, yeah, you got the workplace, you got social media where they can say awful things, but I'd say the most profound transformation can happen in your own personal relationships. And sometimes mm. you're in those very unhealthy relationships and you're yeah. not even aware of it. But once you become aware of that, this person you depend upon or that you thought loved you or whatever the case may be is undermining your reputation. Mm. It, it, are those relationships you just cut off or is there a way you can work through and make them aware that you're aware? Right. And, and call them out in the behavior? How, how, how should we think about dealing with, you know, more personal relationships? Right, right. You know, that's a tough one. What I think, I think reflect, uh, relationships are reflections of our present frequency, our present selves. And so there's two things to do. One is you can't just say, okay, that person's evil, that person's bad. You're like, I signed into this contract, right? I, I joined in this relationship and I'm still here right now. So let me, let me do some work on myself to see where I've allowed this. How have I created this? How have I created a space? Remember when I was talking about that warehouse, I put a table in the middle of a warehouse, everybody was working around it, and then by a week it was filled up. People will fill the spaces that you give them. So if I ask myself, what spaces did I give for this relationship to be in this space, for this person to be this way, right? And have I endured it? If it's something you see in the beginning, and you're like red flag, you can get out. But if you've been through it, then I've endured it. And if you're like, how have I endured it and why? That's where you do your own internal work one of the most important things. But when you start to notice that the trend is consistent and you're staying in the relationship, you have to check with yourself because just like that, that first quote that I loved, it's not the lie. It's not the lies that break the relationship. It's the truth, right? You have to see where you're lying to yourself. And when you realize that you've lied to yourself, you present the truth to yourself first, and then you present the truth to the relationship. And what is a perfect testament is how the person reacts or responds to that truth. If they react, then that's, that's, that's totally different. If they're reacting, they're trying, to pre they're trying to preserve the way it was because they liked it. If you're trying to say, I want to update us, and they react, that means that they want to downgrade. But if you present that truth and they say, I want to upgrade, then there's hope for the relationship because you have a new contract that you are going into. It's all about the contracts. But if the person doesn't meet their, their end of the bargain or you realize that you want a new contract and they're not willing, then that's when you realize you have to go. Now, also, in the same way where we as individuals often find ourselves gaslighting, and this happens in a relationship very often, especially when you're trying to break up. If you find the truth is that you're not happy, what many of us do is we look for all the problems in the relationship because we don't want to break up on grounds of, I don't love you anymore. They don't want to break up on grounds of, I just don't think this relationship is healthy and I need to leave. You want to break up on grounds of, Give me enough evidence as to why you're an evil person, because that'll give me the strength to get out of the relationship. And so what you do is you hold this massive record of wrongs and you start to push them away and you start to be cruel and you start to do all these things that you wouldn't normally do and, and, and bicker and get to this point where you have these crazy arguments just so you can finally break up and then tell the story of how you were innocent. This is dangerous. Because what you're doing is you have signed a contract of how you get out of relationships. And that will reverberate in your other relationships. You can only be better than your evolution, your previous evolution. And so what happens is instead of finding evidence to find problems, because what that is, is it's like, a, it's like a, this spaceship. In order for it to break gravitational pull, it has to have atomic explosions underneath it, which is dangerous. What we want to do is we want to understand that that's not a requirement. You need to just come to your truth and speak your truth. Because if you do it in honesty and in integrity, that raises your frequency for the next relationship that you have. That's how we sometimes gaslight to break up out of relationships. So it happens to us and we do it to others unconsciously as well. Yeah, 100%. Those are really good points. And one of the things I learned in negotiation, they, they call it a BATNA, right? The idea is you're up in the balcony, you're looking down, you're getting the big picture. And the BATNA is as an across that stands for best alternative to negotiated solution, right? So mm. in other words, you have to have your walk away in a relationship. You have to have some absolutes right. that you won't accept from whether it be abuse, cheating, whatever uh, standpoint. And I think it's important to go, know going in what that looks like and to tell the other person, what does that look like? So there is really no surprise. Here's the game. Here's the rules. If you break the rules, that's okay. 
we, we find another person to play with, right? It's not the end of the world, man. Really not the end of the world. That was, so. that was great. I love it, man. You know, I call it, I call it rules of engagement. You know, and I've actually, I've done that in, in relationship as I learn something new, I write down a new rule of engagement, right? And this is something that I want to be a book because really the thing is, is that when you understand the rules, then it's just like, you know, you look at the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, you look at all these books, you look at the, the 10 commandments, you look at the, you know, the laws of our land. What happens is when you have rules that everybody signs off on, then all you have to do is point to the wall hey, we committed right. to this. You just point to the contract. So there's no longer, da, 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 I told you it's not about me versus you. It's we're committed to this. And you, you didn't commit to that. You broke that contract. So how can we ameliorate it? Not how can I use that against you and stab it against you every time that you annoy me or call me out on something. But hey, this is what we said we're going to do. Let's work to do that. Well, it's kind of like what you're saying in business. You know, people get let go because they didn't meet their commitments. They committed yep. to something and the, job, the boss's job is to make sure they meet the commitments. I've always said that I've never fired anybody in my life. They always fire themselves. Mm -hmm. the standards here and they want to come in here. That's fine. That, that's really okay. Yep. It's really about like SpaceX. They're not looking for people down here. They're looking for people up here. And I'm not saying necessarily in intelligence, but in energy and effort and vision and going after that collective goal to get to Mars, right? Yeah. He, has, so, he fires people that are that say, I, that can't, it's not possible. If he hears the words, that's not possible. He's like... Right, you're it's, not, it's a whole here. psychological study. You have one person or group of 10 that's negative. It's like a cancer. Just mm, right. blows the whole thing up. So, yeah, I think it's really important going in the relationship with, you know, and I think what happens in relationships in many other areas of life is people are afraid to lose that thing that they really just fell for. This beautiful girl, this good looking guy, right. and they're afraid to lose that trophy, that image, that projection of what they want to be seen as. And so they're willing to put up with a lot of craziness in the process. Mm. And they're not willing to be honest with what's important to them. And of course, naturally it never works out because if you can't have your, your real self as part of a relationship and you have to hide in the shadows just to keep this person on board, number one, it's, ex it's exhausting. Number two, it's not going to work long-term. Mm, man, that is, that's 100%. And it ties back to what we talked about core fears. If I believe fundamentally that I'm not worthy of love and someone shows me what I would define as love, but they're abusive or they're, it's an unhealthy relationship. My fear is that there's nobody else out there that will love me that way. And so you get the math, you know what I mean? You get, you get why they think what they're thinking. And so because, and that's why my work is so important on breaking you free of the false beliefs, these distracted, distorted thoughts. Because if you can break free of the distorted thoughts, if you can say, okay, what I'm thinking, we're going to put over here. And when you set what you're thinking, what your fears are about yourself over here, then you're like, okay, then what's left? Well, this thing is still breathing. Okay, so it means I'm not my thoughts. Just that thought alone frees people. When you realize that I'm not my thoughts, you gain freedom. Secondarily, you say, these thoughts aren't real. These thoughts sprung from traumatic experiences in my past or from uh, different experiences that I had from my parents or society telling me what normal is. Okay, so now that these aren't real and they're not mine, then what am I? that's when you start to do the work. That's when you start to build foundation on footing that's real. And then from there, anything that comes against you, you're like, nah, mm -mm, I've done the work. I know the difference between a manipulation and, I, and my, my reality. And because of that, it frees you to do the most important thing. And that's what we talked about before. We said the people who want the adulation of their parents or their relationship or who are rebelling because they don't feel they'll get it, so they rebel. It's two sides of the same coin. But the goal is to know who you are and go up. That's when you get that bird's eye view. That's when you can look at everything without your emotions flaring at all times, without saying that this is the only person that can be for me, without saying that if I don't get this love, then I can't. It puts you in a space to where you are free from the cacophony below. And then but, you can fly in and help. <clears throat> it's so critical, Burke. I mean, the, the idea that the foundation is fundamental, right? Your foundation of life, which is what you believe in, which I think at some level is a moral construct for you. I'm not saying you buy into a Judeo-Christian or mm -hmm. the Quran or whatever, but whatever the moral construct is for you, you need one. We all need one because that becomes reality. That becomes the horizon. Just like when you're flying a plane, you have the attitude indicator. You know, if you're up, you know, if you're going up, you're going down. If you're at a certain angle, uh, you know where you are in relationship to the horizon. Mm -hmm. And so this is so important to understand what is it I believe so that when you get into a situation where people are trying to pull you a certain direction morally, where you know in your gut it doesn't really fit who you are. You know, the people that have guilt at some level are the people that went and did things that they know that aren't right for them. 
but they didn't honor themselves to your point. They didn't really connect with themselves. They valued this perceived value in this relationship, this other relationship to such a degree that they're willing to fundamentally disrespect themselves. I mean, mm. ultimately that's what it is. Um, you know, and maybe it's, they're trying to test the waters that we had very, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, very, what's, what's what I'm looking for. Parents that were very controlling mm. that were very dogmatic. I remember on my show, uh, probably about almost a year ago, I in interviewed a girl that ended up being a hooker in Vegas and doing drugs and then found God. And she says, what got me in that direction was I had very uh, controlling, dogmatic, fundamentalist parents. Other than that, she had a great home. And she wanted to taste sort of the, the water on the other side, if you will. Right. And she went into that world. And, and so and, and she came back to that was a lot of pain. Uh, certainly, I grew a lot in a lot of different ways because of it. But if I had to do it over again, I'd probably make a different choice. So I think the idea of having at an early age what it is you believe in. I think, you know, when people are young, they're trying to figure it out, right? I mean, right. there is no manual. There is no book. And that's why a lot of parents, they, they rebel against them. And, and so I, I get that that search for meaning and that search for their own individual fit and place in this world. Uh, but ultimately, whatever it is, I think it's it's so important for us to have some moral construct about what the values are that that really give meaning to our life and foundation to our life yeah man one of the you said it right on because understanding values because when you know your values then you can learn somebody else's values and see where there's connections right when i do work in corporations one of the best and this is it's like a cheesy exercise because they're like why are we putting post-its on the wall but what i do is i have them there's this massive list of values that they choose from like what resonates with you and they say, okay. And then they write it down. They write it down on a post, post it, what values three to four max uh, resonate. And this is, you know, you have a hundred people that are here and they're writing it down. And then I say, okay, great. Now that you've chosen those three, which is very difficult and people want to choose 10, but the truth is when you, you have to, the, the understanding is reductive, right? The more you take out, the clearer it gets. So you come down and you have these three values and I'm like, okay, great. You have the values, but they sound good, but what do they mean? to you, I want you to create a definition, not a dictionary definition, a definition of what it means to you. For me, excellence. What's the definition? If better is possible, good is not enough. That's my definition. So what I've done is I've added dimension to it where it's defined to who I am. And then what we do is we have people from different departments meet up and they read their values and they share. And what they start to know is they start to see strings, the values connect, people that they never talked to, right? They're seeing these values connect and they're like, oh my goodness. I didn't know. So I asked questions. What did you guys learn? They're like, three of my people share the same values. And then we start to notice that there's very specific values that are showing up. So then we all get up and put them on the wall and we organize and we realize that about four values show up between all people. And these are very different people. When you come down to, this, to the nuance, to the center, and you find out what people care about, then they realize we're all the same. Then what I say is once you move from that lowest common denominator, then you work out to change the world. Because you can't work out to change the values. That's impossible. I won't change my values, but I can work in to change our perspectives on how we utilize and behave with these values, how we can work interdimensionally. That's where the power is at. That's where the, the magic is at. But it does come down to just like you said, and just like we're talking about the individual work. Who am I? What do I care about? Great. Now that I know that, who are you and what do you care about? Oh, that's why you act that way. Okay. So what, what shared values do we have? Oh, okay. So what can we do together that is actually conducive to the building of the planet versus destructive? Okay. We can do that. Let's not do this because that's destructive. Let's do this. And then what happens is we don't identify an entire person or entire tribe as this or that. But we, un we understand that there's nuance to it and that's where power is made. That's well, that's well said, Berkey. I really love that. So another tactic, key tactic that gas ladders will use is they'll deflect the conversation mm -hmm. from the real topic you brought up, right? And we've mm -hmm. seen it happen all the time, right? They'll deflect or accuse you of something. They'll challenge your memory or imagine things that are not real, not real, or, or I'd call them crazy makers, right? And we've, we've seen it, right? You say, hey, this is really bothering me. They deflect it to something else. And they'll say, you always, you, you never, right? Mm -hmm. They use sort of absolute. So how can a person regain frame control and keep the conversation on? point or topic when they're being gaslighted. Right, right, right. You know, to a certain extent, you have to understand that you just, you can't with some. <laughs> I think that's important. One of the tough things is that when, I, when you provide a person tools, you can actually increase their frustration. Like, let's say that I give somebody um, a hammer, right? And 
they need to staple something. <laughs> like it's like, it almost becomes more frustrating that you have the tool and the tool is not going to do what you want it to do. So I think the first thing is acceptance. You have to understand that people who gaslight the people that, you know, use straw, the straw man uh, argument or all these different processes uh, to be very slippery is because they want to keep their identity and they want to uh, cause something within you. Your job is to first accept. I can't change people's minds. I can't. All I can do is change how I respond to things. All I can do is connect to what I care about. All I can do is share my light. Now, that's the first thing, because if I provide a tool first, then people start to try to use the tool. If the tool doesn't work, it just makes me even more frustrated. One of the things in order to kind of maintain your reality is to notice what you feel when the person is doing it. Our emotions are guidance systems, and they tell you when you are in a state of reaction or in a state of response. If you are in a state of cloudiness, fight or flight, or a space of clarity. When someone says something, and you feel something, a jolt, there's chemicals from the hypothalamus, they're shooting through the body, right? So you, when you feel that, you need to teach yourself to understand that that's a flag. I've been triggered. And I know the word triggered has kind of taken its own space, but all of us are triggered. So I've been, something has triggered an emotional response within me. And if I feel that remote emotional response, then I'm probably going to react. My job is to pause. If I can pause, then I can say, what is my intention? What is my goal here? What is the outcome that I look for? Because if my outcome is to convince somebody who literally is finding joy to a certain extent and disagreeing with me, then I'm in a wrong place. This is not my battle. This is not my battle. You can just make one calm statement, move on, exit, right? But if you feel that the person's willing to pay attention, willing to listen, then you say, okay, hey, I appreciate what you're saying. Okay, you said this certain thing here. Now, our topic of conversation was about this. I'm happy to move to this space, but can we finish what we were talking about in the, in the instance in the beginning? That can't happen when you're emotionally frazzled. And you hear this when you hear interviews. Somebody says something, right? And then they ask a random question and then you respond to that question. But the topic and the reason of your conversation was here. You know, one of the tools that they use uh, when people are talking, interviewing, when they don't want to answer something, they say, don't you think it's wrong that blah? And it's a very poignant question that's answering a very specific thing, right? But what, what a f- beautiful way to flip that is what I do think is wrong is blah. And so it sounds because they use the wrong and it's saying think, they think that it's the same thing that's being said, but they're two separate things. That's when you're like, okay, hold on for a second. I appreciate you sharing that, but my question is specifically about this. And if you don't have an answer for that, tell me you don't have an answer. Don't act like you answered it. So what happens is only until you become awake and see the processes and how people work. And if you come to a place where you accept that some people are going to slither no matter what, Even if you're in a relationship, they're going to weave, they're going to move around. Your boss isn't going to say why he didn't give you the job, the higher, uh, the uh, raise, but he gave it to somebody else. There's only so much you can do. But the first thing that you can control is how you react, because then that gives you options on how to respond to allow them to give an opportunity to speak their truth. Or if they're not, just let it go. I like that word slither. Another another fancy way of saying snake, and there's a lot of snakes in the grass. Yeah, right, dude. For sure. For we sure. got some, we need some lawnmowers, man. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so another tactic I've seen in gaslighters is they will get you to question your reality and perception of everything. And I'm sure we've experienced this some, you know, from time to time, but they want to gain control over you by distorting your understanding of reality, right? They'll say, How could you think that? Or aren't you just getting emotional over nothing, right? They they sort of trivialize what you're thinking and feeling, right? Mm-hmm. And the point of view you're trying to make. So they leave the person, again, to lose confidence in what they think they're seeing mm-hmm. um, or what their, their idea of reality is. So how does a person in that state sort of come back to reality when something – and these are pretty, I would argue, very severe emotional shots. Right. People are getting crossed about because the people that's doing it, we have an emotional connection to. Maybe we're in a relationship with them or maybe it's our boss that really – our career is on the line, our future – uh, potential to get promoted is on the line or that, that pay raises on the line. So right. these are emotionally explosive experiences. So how does a person regain the mental balance mm-hmm. and that frame control? I call it frame control, right? You see it all the time where in a negotiation, they're always trying to get control of the frame. Who's the guy? Who's in control of what? And I think these are all tactics that these people use, but given the emotional component, how does somebody keep emotional, uh, right. the, the balance in, in, in that, in that sort of scenario? Right. Uh, you know, it goes back to the Socratic method. Questions, the questions are the, are the key. If you can, if you can control the questions, you really can control the space for most people. Some people are uh, adept in other ways, but 
what I, what I do is if let's say somebody says that's crazy, like, how do you actually believe that? Right. I say, I say, okay, I appreciate that you think it's crazy. Can you please explain to me why you think it's crazy? And you start, when you flip the question back, it puts them into a space where they have to explain it. And the truth is most people that are emotional don't know exactly why they've been given a thought. And then, so they take that thought and they speak it. But once that's done, once they, their fuel is out, you just ask more questions, ask more questions. And then when you kind of take that Socratic approach, like, tell me what's crazy about it specifically. Well, da -da 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 -da. okay. So you think that, da -da -da. okay. And then you just kind of take them, you just, just keep pulling that thread. When you pull the thread, there's going to be a point where they are either running out of things to say, or you can say, oh, well, I agree with that. When you say you agree with that, you've appeased their own identity, and it, you have to genuinely agree with it, but agree with that. You find where the commonality is. When you find the commonality, you aren't a threat. Then you can climb back up that thread and say, and speaking of what we both agreed on, this is why I perceived it from this space. Can you, could you understand that? Does that make sense? I'm curious. It really did, because maybe it doesn't. I'm not trying to prove anything except you haven't done your research right? Or that you have done your research. All I want to do when we're having the conversation is make sure that I'm not wasting my time with a person who is just emotionally attached to an idea, right? All I want to do is I just want to ask enough questions to where hopefully they see, whoa, there's, okay, this, this goes deep. And I can't just give these fluffy one word answers. And I have to take it to another level. So really, when you stay calm, you can ask questions because you want to know. And he who has the questions controls the frame, absolutely. And when you find a commonality, you diffuse them. That's really, I mean, any type of negotiation, the goal is to make the person not feel threatened. If they feel like they're winning, if they feel like there's some concession from you, then they're more willing to engage. If I'm like, well, I actually do agree with you there. They're like, oh, okay. So I've saved face, my identity is safe, right? Now I'm willing to talk. The secret man above all of this stuff, it's all identity. Everybody is stuck in their identity and they're so terrified above all things being wrong. Being wrong terrifies people. And so they will create realities to not be wrong. But if I can teach people to not fear being wrong, to trust that a wrong idea doesn't make a wrong person, right? That a mistake doesn't make you a mistake. If I can teach people to be so certain in who they are, then we can engage in a conversation and it, we won't have to go to you're crazy. We don't have to identify it as who you are as a person, who I am as a person, but it's an idea. And we have that undercurrent of shared values. That's, yeah. that's the goal. It's a lot of work. But that's oh. the goal. <laughs> what you're saying is a ton of work. And I've heard, you know, I've heard he who makes gold makes rules. I've never heard he who asks the right question controls the conversation. It's sort mm -hmm. of a similar notion, but it's mm -hmm. true, right? The whole Socratic method, how deep in a topic is that person invested in terms of their understanding is, is pretty fundamental. And, you know, another key tactic that these gaslighters will use is to use your compassion against you. It's used as a weapon, right? So when they get confronted on the issue, they flip it around and they want to appeal to your compassion. They'll say, how could you say that? Or how, how, you, know, you know how much I care for you, right? So they use the emotional, the compassion mm -hmm. end of it. And in the end, they're using the compassion or your compassion as a weapon uh, against you to keep you off balance. Again, it's another tactic. So um, how, how can people be aware Mm. Uh, that I mean, it's subtle. We're talking very subtle things, right? We're not saying they're coming out with a scream, yelling at you like, I'm going to take your compassion and use it against you. It's very subtle. It's very artful mm. in how they manage and control people. Absolutely. <clears throat> this is, you know, most, most usually in the real world, people that are gaslighters, um, they have their own stories and traumas and experiences. It's not as malevolent or malicious or agenda oriented as, you know, larger entities, but it's really tough in these situations because empathy is, it's a guilt mechanism. Like I thought you'd be there for me. You know what I mean? You, you were in this, uh, you were having this call and you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Uh, you were, you were busy with this person. I reached out and then I thought that you'd be there. How could you, how could you leave me like this? I've done all this different stuff, right? It's very hard uh, to avoid the guilt space. And, and this is, this is, this is a very nuanced space, but you have to really know who you are. You gotta know, you gotta know right and wrong because it's very easy to be manipulated by that and be like, I'm sorry. Because we think that if I throw you and I'm sorry, then whew, I've appeased you and we're back to okay. Right. And they may use it against you for a little bit, but what happens is when you, if I give someone I give my dog a treat. My treat, my dog's not going to be like, thanks, and then walk away. 
it's going to come right back, look up to me, and it's going to be like, where's the treat? Another treat. What happens is our minds work that way. So what you have to do is, especially to kind of set a precedence in these type of relationships, is to be like, hey, I am so sorry that you feel the way that you feel. That. You've, you've distinguished it's their feeling, right? You separated yourself from saying, I'm sorry for what I did. Because if you haven't done anything wrong and you've done the internal work to see that, like I was in a meeting, right? Then you say, I'm sorry that you feel the way that you feel. I do not ever want to do anything that makes you feel this way. Those are true statements. But I did not say that I'm sorry for what I did. I appease and acknowledge that they feel something. I honor it. I honor that this is not what I want to be. I'm identifying with the idea that I'm not one of somebody who wants to make you feel this way. And I have to say at the same time, however, I had to do what I had to do. This was the space that I was in. This is the situation. And I hope that you can understand that. It's fair, right? That's fair. And then what happens is people, it puts them into a space where they're like, shoot, it is. And a great question to ask is, that's fair. At the end of the conversation, that's fair. Because they're in a place like, yeah, it is fair. And so what you do is you allow yourself to attend to their wounds because you don't want to be defensive. I, I had to be in the meeting, right? If you're that way, then you're saying what you feel is irrelevant and wrong. You don't want to do that because that'll only escalate things. But I appease, I understand, and then I make that statement. And then afterwards, once peace is made, I'll say, hey, I just want to let you know, when you said what you said, it made me feel as though you felt that I was wrong for doing what I did. I want to make sure that you, have, you are entitled to feel everything that you feel, 100%. But I want you to be able to understand and try to come from my perspective as well so we can get to a resolution without it being a bad guy versus a good guy. Right? It's, not the, it's not who's the bad guy and who did it wrong. It's what can we do next time to prevent this from happening? Okay, this is what we've decided. We'll add that to the rules of engagement. Right? That's, that's just how it happens. And this is where you can create this power where there's trust and stability. Because if not, the propaganda by the emotions, it's, it, everything that happens, just like you said on the macro level, happens on the micro level. If you can't control the micro level, you've got a problem on the macro. Like when people get sick, it's not that like their whole, it's, it's trauma inside that happens. That's how it kills you. It's a cancer that kills from the inside outside, right? So you have to deal with it, excise the issue, focus on it, understand why it got there. Oh, it's I'm eating this way. I'm doing this. And then you make those changes and those shifts. So that's one way. It's don't let yourself be emotionally reactive. Don't nullify the person's feelings. Hear them, understand them, but separate. Don't apologize for what you shouldn't apologize. Then explain your purpose. Say it's fair, why I did what I did. And then work around it to say, how do we avoid this situation again? I was going to say, Berkey, your, your approach is magnanimous, patient, and, and really honoring of the other person. And, and, and it's just interesting, that the strategies and tactics. And then I think about all those vampires in our lives that are just training. Where right. you try those approaches, and <laughs> at some point, you just got to, like, cut. You know, at some point, you know that their, their modus operandi is guilting, victimhood, victimization, um, pure, bold-faced, manipulate, control, deceive, yes. whatever. Um, so I, I admire your, your approach because certainly it, it, you need to do that in business. I've had bosses like this. I've had boss, bosses that are guilt machines, right? Right, it's right. Way to manage. <laughs> Not very effective, but man, it, it, to have that a patient approach, I, I really admire what you're talking about, uh, the heart that you come at it with. And, and sometimes I think just given how busy my life is, I, I've sort of perfected the art of – there's certain key relationships you got to work through the process, no question about it. And then there's other other relationships, right? Um, that you decide to cut cut bait on pretty quick. I mean, you you identify and you say, look, it, it's beyond my ability. I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist. I'm not in a position to really understand the dynamic. Right. But I just know one thing: it's exhausting. It feels like I just got the blood sucked out of me. They, you know, I, I've talked about that time vampires and, and then, and there's, there's a time and place for that. I think when you know who you are, you know, what's, what's a vampire, right? You know, you're like, you can start to pick it up. Right. So one of the things that, that I do is I absolutely will cut off and I just, I do it by asking very specific questions. What I do is I flex back. For example, I remember I was talking with somebody about some work that we were going to do. And, and I noticed that it wasn't like really happening. Like it was just, you know, when somebody's kind of just like floating out there in space, and I just asked some very specific questions. And I'm like, when do, we, when do you think we have this done? And can we guarantee that it can be done by this time? And she wanted to bring in another group of people. And I'm like, okay, uh, I want you to gauge on a one to 10 how serious they are on acting and moving because I'm ready to go right. within the next 90 days. Right. What happens is all of a sudden they're like, okay, this, this is, I'll, I may pull myself out of this because the more clear I am, the more they realize this person doesn't play that game. 
right? If I had that conversation with a person, let's say that, that, that kind of situation where the person's like, oh, you don't care. If I had that conversation multiple times, what I call is a trend. I never judge a person on what they do. I judge people on the trend. And the judgment is not a condemnation. It's just a categorization and understanding of where they're at, right? So when I see the trend, I'll talk about the trend. And I'll say, hey, I just want to let you know I'm noticing a trend of this. This needs to stop. It needs to shift in some way, shape, or form. Or if not, the relationship's going to shift. There's going to be a dynamic change. I just want to let you know that. Now, because I'm so clear on who I am, when they hear that, they're going to be like, he's not, what do I do? I can't use the same tactic. He's put a light on it and he's shown it to me. So what I'm doing is I'm still honoring them as a human being in their space. But I'm just saying, hey, the dynamic of relationship is going to shift. It's going to happen. Now, if they have an attitude with that, it's very rare that I ever cut somebody off. What happens is they have to cut themselves off or I'm moving so fast that the cord snaps. Right. right? That, and, and that works too. Even there's times when in my, as I've developed, there are people who are ahead of me and they just, I cut myself off. Right. It's, it's okay. It's not about, it's not this huge condemnation on who I am as a person. It's just between the relationship of these two people. So being able to understand that allows you to, to have that freedom, but I don't let anger be my scissors because right. if anger is my scissors or, or, or being overwhelmed is my scissor, unless it's like some person that's going too much. My thing is you're not at the frequency. Like you're not at the level right now. You're not at the level. So I won't say that directly to their face, but I will make a way to move out. I've done that. I've done that from when I was employed to self-employed to business owner. Each process, you lose some friends. It just happens. Man, right? that's so important what you're saying. It's so true. And I think it's silver bolt to relationships. The number one clarifying healthy aspect to relationship is clarity. That to me is a silver bullet. When you're clear with somebody who's not clear, when you're clear with somebody who's sort of vague and, and not as committed or flaky, that's actually the best thing you can give that person clarity in a loving way. I'm not saying with a anger, I'm right. talking clarity. Here's my standard. And they know when they deal with you, you got to come at a certain level. Otherwise it's not worth it. It's not, it's going to be so uncomfortable. I don't even think about it. And it's yep. really the best thing for that person is the standard. Here's the clarity on the standard that we're looking for. Maybe in a romantic relationship or in a business relationship. I, I think it's a gift. And the idea that, Hey, we're all different places on the continuum right. of, you know, degrees of evolution, advancement. And like you said, I like that, you know, some of us are flying around with a drogue shoot and we have a guy that's in an F-35 or, or right. F-22 Raptor uh, <laughs> with, with afterburners on going, and he's not going to be interested in flying with a drogue shoot. Yep. He wants to be flying with aerodynamic qualities. To right. That, that aircraft. And we got to be part of that aerodynamic quality that's going at the same pace or maybe desire to even go faster at some point, right? So the idea that we're all coming to the drogue shoots, I think we are at some level. And eventually the drogue shoot goes from here and gets smaller and smaller over time to almost it's infinitesimal, not there, as we evolve. Absolutely, man. And, and as we evolve, you know, some people are in your life for, you know, the long term, sometimes it's for a season. And I think that, you know, people are so terrified, but I, I forgot who it was. There was, I don't know if it was Eckhart Tolle, but there was just, I, oh, no. There's somebody that's talking about they love going to different countries to meet people without keeping their, without getting their information. It's like, I just want to enjoy my existence with you now. Then I travel and I'll probably die never seeing you. You'll die never seeing me. There's something, and, it, and it's hard because it's like, you know, everybody, everybody's taking a picture of everything. We have millions of pictures on our phones that we never look at. But it's just because we want to we keep it. And this idea of keeping is to never really be present. And so to just let this moment that I have, I'm in Paris right now, I'm having this baguette next to this person, we talk for a moment, and then it's done. And it's the ability to just enjoy the moment. And so people think that relationships must be forever. But when you understand that some people are just for seasons, myself being a season for somebody else at the same time, you just cherish the moment. And so it's not about clinging. It's not about keeping. It's not about we want to keep these pictures that we'll never really utilize or honor. It's about, no, let me, this, if this sunset, I want to see it, not through my phone. I want to see it with my eyes. And when it's gone, it'll never come back. And isn't permanence an illusion? It is an absolute illusion that has a real life effect on the way that we exist. Yeah. Well, it's so true because there is nothing that's permanent and there's nothing that's certain, although yeah. we work, work really hard to make that. So I think the last thing I sort of came across uh, tactics that Gaslighter uses is they turn what's important to you against you, right? They mm -hmm. will question your talent. They will question your key relationships you have. And the goal is obviously to destroy your sense of self-worth and who you are at the core, your identity. So how can we create a greater awareness when this is happening? Because again, I would argue all these gaslighting techniques are very subtle. Some aren't so, but 
oftentimes it's subtle that just questions or causes people to question their own identity, their own self-worth and who they are. I mean, I, I remember times where, um, you know, I learned to fly planes in the Air Force and then you get into other situations where those organizations because of politics and maybe jealousy or whatever's going on, the dynamics that you just can't fully see and, and, and appreciate and be aware of, they're trying to just cut down the confidence, right? They're trying to etch away um, your sense of self. And right. it's almost like in every new situation, we got to keep the edge. We got to keep the focus. And every situation we get into, uh, we got to continue to evolve our, our skill sets and our capabilities and, and our ultimate, you know, uh, you know, competence in that situation. So um, anyway, so how, how can we create a greater awareness when this is happening? Because I would argue if you don't, let's say you were really successful at this, you know, right. in your thirties and forties, you get to your forties and fifties when it gets really important to keep your job and be competent. And yet you lost all your confidence. This really matters. So how, how do we create a great awareness and what are some things we can do to prevent this from happening? I love that. I love that. You know, this is, um, <clears throat> this is where the sages of the past are the best, um, best examples to me. If you read a book called Siddhartha, and you learn about the Buddha. Um, if you read the Bible, the gospel, and just hear how Christ talks. I mean, I've done some, some, some very deep studies on, on Christ. And there's just some really, and it ties back to, this is all old news, man. Um, and this is why I think that, you know, you just look at the persons that have done it better than you could even imagine and just mimic that, right? But for example, you know, there is a, Jesus was walking, and the, the, the Pharisees, who are the highly religious, but kind of evil people, uh, deceptive, they found a prostitute in the act, and they threw her to the ground. They're like, we're supposed to stone her. That's what it says. So they're like, Jesus, what are we, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to stone her. It says that Jesus was just writing and drawing in the sand, which is just incredible to me. It's like, he, as they're yelling, like saying, hey, we need to murder this person. He's just drawing in the sand, which totally is this opposite to the chaos that's happening over there, drawing in the sand. Then he stands up and he says, uh, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. Mm. He knew they were trying to test him. You're going to kill her? What are you going to do? The law says kill her. What are you going to do? Was that a mic drop moment for Christ? <laughs> Dude, he, and he's had this so many. There, there's so many, man. So many. Another one, when he was, um, when he was uh, before Pilate about to be murdered, Pilate's like, these people were telling lies about what he would do. They made lies up so that he could get killed. And it says Jesus was quiet. Like a sheep before the shear, he was silent. He had nothing to prove. That goes back to my quote. The man who has nothing to prove proves everything already. Pilate says, do you know I have the power to whether you live or die? He's like, you don't have that power. He's like, that power was given to you by God. God has the power. This is, this is some insane stuff. It says because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Like this, when you look at how Jesus lived, and in the book Siddhartha, how the Buddha does it, is incredible as well. Um, there's also another book called The Prophet. Just so, but what happens is when you know who you are, it doesn't matter anymore because everybody's trying to test you. Everybody's trying to push and pull you and get you to say or do or think or act a certain way but if you know who you are, so Christ knew, he's like, I came from God. I know what I'm here to do. You're going to kill me. This is what's like, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And so that type of awareness is the goal. Now, obviously we can't get it to the place where we're like at that level, but we can work ourselves to know ourselves because when you know yourself, you can call BS. It is clarity because when you know, when you're clear in mind, every time you hear somebody speak, you're like, I know that smell. I know that smell. Because 10 years ago, I was in that place. When I see people, I see myself. When I see people that are better than me, I say the only difference between you and I are, are time. You're at a, you're another level. I listen to Eckhart Tolle. I listen to um, uh, what, Wayne Dyer. I listen to, when I'm hearing some of these people think and speak, right? When I listen to like a sad guru, you're just like, okay, even Tony Robbins, because he's repetitively worked in so many different ways. And you just sit and you're like, ooh, okay got it so what happens is you start to understand how minds work and since you understand how your mind works you understand how to maneuver through the world it always goes back to clarity when you know who you are you can't be pulled but when you don't all that can happen is pull because it just takes a little shake to get you unstable and if you just get a little almost just imagine you're like you're in space if i can just push you off the shuttle and you're out and floating i can i can do whatever i want i can push you in one direction and you'll just go 
if you don't know yourself, you can't get yourself anywhere. So it's about grounding yourself. I've used the word yourself so much. I hear it. Grounding yourself into yourself. And then from there, walking throughout the world, then you won't be a, a, a reaction, a ricochet, an echo to the thoughts, ideas, sentiments. Boy, it, it just, it, my mind's just spinning right now because, you know, I think fundamental when people say, I want to be a, law, a lawyer, a doctor, a business person or whatever, and their number one goal is a certain standard of living, lifestyle, X dollars in their bank account. Um, and then you say, who are you? What is your identity, really, in this Western culture, in Newport Beach, in Atherton? Um, in Beverly Hills, wherever it may be, where there's lots of money, what is your value? What is your identity rooted in? And the idea, if it's rooted always in money and, and power and position, prize, right, or your net worth, right, equals your self worth, um, you really end up with an identity crisis. And this is fundamental. And when you're in that way, and that is your value system, and it gets rocked, it's a fundamental identity crisis. It's a fundamental. I would say it's a fundamental confidence loser, net net. Absolutely. Versus I'm more than that. As a person, my worth is in something more eternal than that, right? It's something more permanent than that. And that's really hard to do because our whole lives are built on performance, achievement. Ultimately, I would argue at some level to have some security, certainty, standard of living, lifestyle. And why do we want the lifestyle? For people at the extreme ends of that, they want to impress people that really don't care about them, honestly. Right, right. right. They're trying to impress people that don't really care about them. But because of the work that hasn't been done or the psychological makeup, we think we have 40 billion or whatever, we're going to be more loved, we're going to be more worthy. And the answer is we won't, we won't. But it's fascinating when you think about gaslighters, I almost know that I would argue that very successful people are gaslit because those gaslighters know that the value system is built on sand at some level mm -hmm. versus that solid granite rock. And, and we've, we've heard about that in the Bible, right? The parable of the man that yep. builds or there's songs about it, man who built his house in the sand versus the right. rock and what happened. And I, and I think that your all your accomplishments can be used against you, can mm -hmm. be made, made to make you feel a lot less confident. So as we're trying to build this incredible life and as we're trying to build this incredible story, that at the foundation, the fundamentals are in a place of who you are, what's your value system, that if you lost it all, you're still that person intrinsically and your right. emotions and your moods aren't dependent upon what's in the bank or the houses you own, or the house you own. None of that matters. It could be all taken away, and you're still that person. And all those great people you talked about, um, Jesus Christ and Mahatma Gandhi, and all the people mm -hmm. that have come as philosophers, right? right? That's one thing I think they fundamentally understood, that, look, if you look back in time and all the craziness, right? We've had all these plagues, world wars, the stock market crashed in 29. We've had all these things happen. It's not like we're, we're living through the first time in history. Right. This is just repetitive, right? And it's our response to things. And this whole series about resilience and, and, and trying to become more resilient is fundamentally, I think, rooted in that foundation. Who are Absolutely. you, what you believe in? That if, it, if everything you built your life around is gone today, are you still that same person where you still have perspective and you can keep a sense of self and sense of perspective? Why, why does that matter? We know with coronavirus and what's going on, the cure is worse than the disease. We know there's epic levels of suicide. We know there's epic levels of violence. You don't think there's a connection when you don't have a job, you don't have hope, right? You have all this craziness going on in the inner cities. It's all connected. It is. And yet it's because intrinsically we're saying our values in this, this area. And when that area goes away, I don't have value. So I'm going to act out. I'm going to strike out. Man. I'll get off my soapbox. Sorry. No, I love it, bro. This is, and it's real. It's real. It's so it's, it's almost spiritual. Um, and the problem is we all have desire. That's natural to humans. Uh, and I think that it's just our metrics. We have improper metrics. How money, the currency is, is the metric, right? But, you know, it, it's, it's only this era, right? There was a time when just being with the family, you know, it's just the, the, you know, you look in France, you look in Italy, break time is like two hours long, three hours long. You know, there's a different, it's different mindsets for different places. It's choosing the right metrics, which is the goal is to choose the metric as a metric of self, self-discovery, self-knowledge. And to understand that just because I buy a car, it doesn't build my identity. Like if I feel better because I purchased something, what does it say about what I feel when I'm naked? right? If there's everything is indicative, there's an inference. Like if I buy a big house and I feel better, then what am I without that house? 
And if I keep pulling away things until it's just me and that's not enough, there's something fundamentally wrong. But the truth is, is that, you know, it's, it's in the Tao, it says, he who speaks does not know. He who knows does not speak. Mask your brightness, temper your sharpness, be at one with the dust of the earth. He who has achieved this is unconcerned with honor or disgrace. This is the highest state of man. Where honor, disgrace doesn't matter. If you can be bright, you don't need to be bright. You have the knowledge, but you don't speak because you don't need to speak. It's, what hap it's the opposites of all the things that are happening, of all the things that we laud and we, we adore and we appreciate. Celebrities, the ideas of these things. What happens is we realize coming back, centering, doing our own work, changing our, our metric, right? Because if we change our metric, we will unconsciously change the metric of our children. And that they're the ones that'll make the better society. Our job is to change our metric and do the work on the inside and get clarity on who we are so that we're not ping pong back and forth by the same person. We think that we're seeing sides, but if you look underneath it, what it is is that it's just fear, anger, it's, it's the disruption of the, of the human spirit. We gotta come to a center. We gotta bring ourselves back and we gotta do that work internally because that's where it makes a shift because we have feet planted on solid rock. Bingo. And you know, it's funny, you got me thinking that it's a purity of intent. Mm. And when you think about life, if our goals are impure, um, are improbable, some levels, but impure, um, you just like when gold is purified, it goes through what? Fire, right. intense, extreme heat. And I would argue in life that as we set our sights on certain goals that aren't pure of intention, of desire, that those will be purified at some level. We'll go through some very extreme times and purification periods in our lives to bring us to the person, the man or woman that God has designed us to be, whatever you believe in. Right. That we're going to be brought through those experiences. Um, and it's funny because you see people gunning after goals and the whole world fell apart. And you hear these quotes like, you know, the measure of a man or a woman and in tough times and how they rise. And the reality is, I think when you have a pureness of intent, kind of like what you're saying, and you don't have to prove that you're sharp and, and you live within, within the flow of life and the flow of your skill sets. And you certainly develop them, ever developing your skill sets, but the heart, the intention, the desire is pure. I think there's what flows from the opportunity. That's where the opportunity flows. And that's where greatness is achieved at some level. But if yeah. we have an impure motive and it's just for our own self gratification, I'll argue we'll go through, pain after pain after pain until we've gone through enough that we as a vessel are fashioned in a way that's been purified at some level. And I think anybody sitting and listening to this, this podcast would argue that in their life, if they've gone through really extreme times, they're trying to figure out, and maybe they're in their twenties, they still have it, but give it time. You will, mm. it'll become crystal clear as to why you went through that time and the man and woman you became and the value system that sort of immersed or that emerged from that time and how it evolved from that time, that is the point. And I'm not saying at 20, if you have a pure, pure heart and mind and goal, and you live that your whole life, you're not gonna have problems. But right. I would say that we, um, we exacerbate the problem when the purity of our motives isn't so pure. And then we wonder why we go through these extreme times, because really ultimately when you're 16, you look back, you'll say, I'm the man or woman I am today with the perspective I've had um, because of some of those mistakes and some of those choices. Right. Absolutely, man. This is, this is, we, we're not getting out of this alive. And so if this is the only time we have to be here, why not understand, right? Why not seek to understand ourselves, individuals, the world, our place in it, um, and work to build a better space. Like this is, this is, and the thing that's, the reason that it's not just noble and it's not because it's a good thing to do is because study after study after study after study talks about how much more standard of wellness you have when you engage in empathy, when you engage in self-work, when you engage in journaling, when you engage in writing the story of your life in a way where you learn lessons and build, when you're able to withhold from reacting, right? The marshmallow test, if you can, the kids that didn't eat the marshmallow so they could get two later ended up being more successful in life because they had discipline the kid and adult who feels an emotion but doesn't react 
They can control it and then come from a different space. They become more successful in life. They can maneuver through the world. They're not constantly in threat. Even if the people who are just hardcore making it to the top, they're constantly terrified of being pulled down to second. There, there's just more wellness in moving in this direction. So if you're going to live, what hormones do you want? Dopamine or cortisol all the right. time? Right. Right? And one's going to send you to your grave faster than the other if you're trying to live long. It, it physically is better. It's good physically, not just a spiritual thing. It's just good. Yeah, and I would argue in this, in this topic today, gaslighters, that can really increase the cortisol levels in a big yeah, one. I think it's being aware of them. Hopefully what we discussed today uh, brings the audience to at least, at least a little bit better understanding of the, the tactics used. I think ultimately, Berkey, it's all about control. Gaslighter does what they do to get one thing, which is control over another person. Mm -hmm. And I think the psychological impacts and the outcroppings of that um, can be measured and certainly on a cortisol level and an enjoyment of life level for sure. So right. uh, I think it's really important to, to identify. And again, I think it goes beyond just, as we've discussed, personal relationships into the corporate world and certainly right. into the media that we see today in the United right. States. I think we're all being gaslit. I think we do it to ourselves at some level. So, Wow, what, what a conversation today, Burke, and uh, really appreciate your, your insights, your wisdom, and, uh, and in a couple of places, certainly the wit. <laughs> Same, back at you, Wynn. Ben, I love this stuff, man. I really, I really think it's, uh, it's just, it's, these are good conversations, um, and, and I think it makes people think. And that's, to, to be honest, at the end of the day, what I say, my goal is not to get a person to go or believe or think a certain way, but to stop and think. If I throw a rock, over the water and it keeps bouncing. If you just stop that rock, it'll naturally sink into truth. And, and people discovering their own truths within themselves makes this work absolutely worth it and these conversations worth it. Couldn't agree more, my friend. Thanks, Thanks Burke. All right, Ben, good talking. All right.